Hi guys, welcome to Game On. As you know, we put out a new video every Friday and this week's video is talking about the five secrets to running a successful game at a convention. If this is the kind of content you enjoy and you get something out of it, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can catch every video we do every Friday. Take it away, Justin. Awesome, hey, guess what? what? Gaming, gaming conventions are back. Sweet, we can actually <laughs> see other people in person. Whoo! Yeah. So I've run convention games. Yes, you have. A couple of times, actually a multiple amount I was of times. Say, you're, you're, you're shorting yourself by a couple of dozen, I think. But. And uh, there are plenty of good tips out there online about what to do to get ready for a game convention as a game master. Well, give us the best ones. Well, I'm gonna give you a couple ones that I think people tend to kind of shy over, and I think it's gonna help you as a game master get ready for running a convention game. Whether it's your first or even if it's your 30th, it's still gonna be nice to help you. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Exactly, so I'm gonna say, we're gonna go over five of them. So I'm gonna say my, my top five here. Are we counting down or counting up? Oh, we're gonna count down. Sweet. So number five is, because you only have a certain amount of time in your time slot, most of them are like four hours, I say avoid filler, random encounters, and shopping as a game master. Well, you, any kind of filler, right? Anything, any time waster. Those are great for campaigns. Yes. They're death for conventions. Exactly. Uh, four hour, you got four hour time slot, a four hour uh, adventure prepared. You're not going to get it done in four hours. It's not going to happen. So. Avoid those at random encounters. Uh, someone wants to go shopping, you just tell them no if it's within reason. If you have the gold for it, you have it. And there is this, um, there's a, uh, an idea in the RPG headspace called hard framing, mm -hmm. where you tell the intro of the story, but they just start at the story. So you might start at the mouth of the cave. Okay. Um, because like you said, travel is great. Because meeting at the tavern just kills time. You yeah, need that. Nothing, exactly. Nothing exciting is going to happen at the tavern. Just get to the cut to the chase. Exactly. But that goes on to number four, which is to spotlight all three pillars of play, which is role play, exploration, and combat. So it's okay to let your players role play a little bit. That's, that's more than okay. Yeah, it's part like, of the game. It's actually the whole game is called a role playing well, game. Well, and it's some of the most mat entertaining material for players when it goes well. So give them the chance to do as much of it as they want. Exactly. As um, long as the story keeps moving. Yes, and and it's okay, you know, if you have a little bit of it, but don't dilly dally on it because you also have to be able to showcase, especially if it's a new system for new players. You want to showcase what the exploration looks like. So what it's like to interact with the environment, yep. not exactly through role play, but through like mechanics, as well as combat. Well, in narrative, right? Like interacting with the environment, the exploration is, is probably the best point yes. for, to develop the narrative aspect of the game. Yeah, and, and I, I understand that a lot of these pre-written modules like to focus on the combat, uh, but, but don't, don't, don't be afraid to, you know, linger just a tiny bit on the exploration mm -hmm. and the role playing. Sure. Now, how do you feel about editing material out of modules for the sake of keeping pace? So this is a tough one because if you're running something like Pathfinder Society or uh, Adventurers League, yeah. you, they, they poo poo on that. Um, I would say if there's something that says you may have random encounters here, just don't do it. Yep. So I'm okay with cutting out some of the things. Mm -hmm. Um, especially the, the travel scenes where they say, describe what it's like. It's like, no, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go to the next scene. You walk past a rock. You yep. walk past another rock. <laughs> yeah. and, and what's really important, number three, is to spotlight every character. and mm -hmm. Or every player. So every player feels like they got some time in the in the spotlight some some time to shine so to speak oh yeah well i mean look they paid to be there yep they're giving you they gave money to show up at the convention they gave time to sign up for your time slot yeah yeah give them their moment in the sun right yeah and it doesn't have to be terribly long but just make sure that you're evening it out so that every player feels like they're appreciated to be there yeah. i understand um some players like to hog it up a little bit uh, you are playing with people that you might not have ever met. Yeah. Um, 
but as the game master, you do have to you have that responsibility to make sure that every player gets seen. Yeah, and is heard. Yeah. yeah, and 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 if you can sort of pick up on what aspects those players like the best and give them more of what they like. Yeah. So number two is actually quite a big one. Um, I picked this up at Gen Con. I was the beginner table for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. And part of that block was I was supposed to run a three hour adventure and help people, six to seven people make characters. Mm. Or sorry, five to six people make characters. So three hours later they had characters. Yes. <laughs> so if you are a game master who's teaching new players how to play and you don't have to make characters, <laughs> Bring pre-gens. Like, uh, that's mm -hmm. just, bring pre-gens. <laughs> um, but I, I picked this up, and I've never seen anyone else do it. I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. Is a, is a pre-filled out, almost completely filled out character sheet. I still touch on how to make the character with these people. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to use a fighter as an example, because this is actually how I came up with it, is... I basically gave that fighter its race and its stats everywhere else, but I let the player choose if they wanted to be a strength-based or a dex-based character. Okay. And then that's when we decided what kind of weapons they wanted to mm -hmm. use, what path they wanted to go down as a fighter. Yeah. But I already came up with their backgrounds. I gave them like two of their four skills and I let them pick the other two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was halfway finished, if not com almost completely finished. All we had to do was just fine-tune what they wanted, yep. and then also for spellcasters, I give them a uh, uh, like a, an index card of what they can pick from, mm -hmm. and then just say, which one do you want? Okay. So we don't have to go through the book yes. and say, this was what we Follow the do. back and forth, hopping between seven different yep. chapters in no particular order, because D&D! <laughs> and, and this is a big one, specifically for Dungeons & Dragons, don't, don't let anyone play a druid. I, I hate to say that, but it's just because then you have to open up 14 different manuals and try to help people pick what kind of animals they want to be and then write down those stats. Just don't use druids. I, I hate to poo-poo a whole class, but if you're doing, if you're teaching people how to make characters. There are certain classes that suck. It's just hard to do. So. Also, don't let, well, don't let. Dissuade people from being bards. Okay. Yeah, huh? Because it's all role play. Yeah. Anyway. Agree to disagree. <laughs> this brings me to uh, my number one, and that is be willing to say no <laughs> as a game master. So if someone wants to play a druid, you might have to say no. Or a bard, in your case, you might have to say no. I'd like to go shopping. No. <laughs> so here's an example. Um, you're coming to a cave mouth. You know you have to rescue the goblin princess in that cave mouth, or in that, in that dungeon. But on the clearing, uh, on the other side of the clearing, there's some mountains that looks like they're, they have some nice springs in them. And one of the player goes, I want to go check out those mountains. No. <laughs> I want to go panning for gold in those mountains. No. Um, you, you feel that your enemies might get reinforcements soon, so you want to go in quick. You want to get in there because there's the possibility that there might be other adventurers who are trying to get the gold before you. So it's nice to have little ways to speed up the game mm -hmm. um, so that players can stay on task. Plot-driven. Plot-driven ways to accelerate the game. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes you do have to just tell players that they should kind of wrap it up. Obviously, that's not nice table-side manners. Mm -hmm. But when you have, you know, a whole combat left and you have a ha an hour left of the, the slot, yeah. sometimes you got to just Yeah, the boss battle and you haven't even gotten to it yet. Yeah. You know, people are already at the surrounding tables are already packing their stuff up. You yeah. Know, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So those are, those are my five tips that I don't see a whole lot of people talking about, but they're, they're tips that I have, I have found through the hard way. Yeah, as running well, and at look, conventions. A, a lot of these tips, a lot of these kinds of things, it's one of those things where people think about, if they stop to think about it, they're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. But you got to remember to do them when it counts. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I will give you one quick extra tip. 
Bonus got a bonus tip. Bonus tip. Five um, plus one. <laughs> uh, I, I know some people don't like this idea, but I'm okay with putting sticky notes in my books to quickly open to things. All right, whoever's not okay with that, you're just not getting gaming. Like, it's not, you don't keep books nice forever. You make them your own. They, they, it's like a pair of shoes. You got to break them in. Yeah. So just having having everything quickly looking up or be willing to make a ruling right on the on the spot. Well, both. You got to yeah. be willing to do both of those. Yeah. Like, it, because again, no matter how well laid out a book is or not, mm -hmm. D&D, um, you're not going to be able to find everything exactly when you need it. And yep. you don't want everything to come to a screeching halt while you're hunting around for a particular rule in a particular book. It's a convention. These guys aren't probably going to see you again, at least for another year. So hopefully by then they forgot about it. <laughs> you know what? If they're that much of a rules lawyer, they should be running a game, not playing it. Why not? So thank you guys for watching. Let us know in the yes, comments please. if there's any other uh, tips that you would give to Game Masters. And I'm sure that we might have a video coming out soon about game or tips for players at the convention too. Mmm, yes. Because you guys have some responsibilities too. It's not all on the guy who brought the the book and the module. So yeah. Thank you guys very much for watching. As always, thank you very much. And game on.